Absolutely, sir. It is mainly uh, based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, number 16, on peace, justice, and strong institutions. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, number uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals number 16, 16. Six. yes goal number 16 number goal. number 16 okay. <coughs> topic will include as I mean the Joe extreme poor Hemera which we went at the area in Korea okay Joe Yoga extreme poor Hoga sir you are already an expert sir you you don't have to prepare, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Thank you. The peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, sir, I think you are muted, Manvinda, sir. Actually, I am trying to coordinate with other faculty members also. Uh, Deepak sir, if you can also ask them to join AASAP. Yes sir, yes sir. I'm doing... Choturam, I have taken paracetamol. Or... Oh, okay, uh, okay. Uh, just for your information sir. Uh, just for information, sir, we are going to be on uh, uh, live YouTube. So, uh, so you have to. Uh, I hope you understand, sir. I I got it. I got it. Got it. Yes. No personal talks. Right. And nobody should be allowed to intervene no while you are delivering the lecture.
हाँ जी गुड आफ्टरनून सर वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून करणदीप सिंह जी आपसे बहुत दिनों के बाद हाँ जी हाँ जी और सुनाओ क्या हाल चाल है बस अभी थोड़ी सी एलर्जी हो रही है ज्यादा कुछ नहीं है बट थोड़ा सा अनकंफर्टेबल हूं मैं थोड़ा सा तो नाक है पानी आ रहा है तो थोड़ा सा प्लीज आप बेर, बेर आप कर लेना आप लोग प्लीज नहीं नहीं सर विल प्रे फॉर यू आप जल्दी ठीक हो जाएंगे और बेस्ट विशेज आर ऑलवेज विद यू बहुत अच्छा लगा सो वंस अगेन है आई वेलकम यू है फ्रॉम द कोर ऑफ माई हार्ट टू ज्वाइन दिस थैंक यू सर And Dr. Manvinder, everything is ready. And Dr. Manvinder, I think everything is ready, sir. But we are just waiting for the students and other faculties to join. Okay, okay, okay. Chalo, ठीक है. हाँ, let's take four, हाँ, four five minutes also. ठीक है, okay. Uh, Vibhuti sir, we are just waiting for a few uh, ah, 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 faculties and students no problem, to join, no and then we can begin very shortly, sir. No, Dick, no problem. गिडियोन आर यू देयर गिडियोन माय ब्राउज़र इज कांट शेयर
गिडियोन आई यू कैन गिव यस सर ट्रेंड ओके कैन यू आस्क अदर स्टूडेंट्स आल्सो ऑफ योर क्लास टू जॉइन द क्लास यस सर या जस्ट आस्क देम या जस्ट आस्क
Dr. Deepak, are you there? Dr. Deepak? Yes, sir. I'm here only, sir. So, I think we can start now. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Kirindeep, are you there? Yes, yes, Dr. Sir. You can start. All the best. All right. Okay. So, yes, sir. Over to you, Dr. Deepak. We okay, can start. Sir. Okay, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are perfectly audible. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon to all. I, Dr. Deepak Sharma, on behalf of the Department of Government and Public Administration, I feel honored and delighted to extend a warm welcome to our guest of the day, Professor Dr. Bhuti Singh Shikhawat, sir. I welcome you, sir, and we thank you with your esteemed presence, sir. I also welcome our of the school and Dean Lovely Professional University, Professor Dr. Pavitra Prakash Singh, who is always a source of inspiration for us. I also welcome our head of the department, Professor Dr. Kiran Deep Singh, a great leader who always encourages us to take good initiatives for the student cause. I welcome you, sir. And I also extend a massive welcome to head of the department from other disciplines, my colleagues, research scholars, and students participating in this guest lecture. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Manvinder Singh for a formal introduction of our resource person. Over to you, Dr. Manvinder Singh. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, most respected uh, resource person of the day, Professor Dr. Vibhuti Singh Shekhawat, Malviya National Institute of Technology, which is a premier institute of national importance. Respected HOF, sir, Professor Dr. Sanjay Modi, sir. Respected Dean and HOS, sir, School of Social Sciences, Professor Dr. Pavitra Prakash Singh, sir. Respected Head of the Department, Professor Dr. Kiran Deep, sir. My dear fellow colleagues, and above all, the pillars of this university, my dear students, a very pleasant good afternoon to all of you. Hey, students and participants, as you all know that today we are gathered here to attend an online guest lecture on a very important topic, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions in India. And I feel privileged and honored to share with you that Professor Vibhuti Singh Shekhawat is among all of us to share his views and thoughts. He is a man of great deeds, a very learned person, a very good administrator, and a very senior person from academics who has a lot of awards and honors to his credit. So, sir, on behalf of the entire management of lovely professional university, I extend a very cordial welcome to you at LPU, sir. I also extend a warm welcome to our HOS and Dean, Professor Dr. P.P. Singh, sir, under whose able guidance and leadership we are able to organize such wonderful programs with a lot of autonomy and freedom. So, sir, I welcome you in this online guest lecture. In any organization and its functioning, the faculty and the students play the most important role. They are the real center of attraction, so I heartily welcome my dear fellow colleagues and the strength of this university, my dear students, in this online guest lecture. Once again, I welcome one and all in this event. Thank you so much. Now, with regards to the introduction of the guest and the resource person, although I will uh, try to uh, introduce him in the bestest way possible, but still he needs no introduction. He is a professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Malviya National Institute of Technology, which is a premier institute of national importance in Jaipur, Rajasthan, India. He was the former head of the department from 2003 to 2006, and again the HOD from 2013 to 2016. He was also the coordinator for French language from 2014 to 2019 there. Regarding his qualifications, he has done MA Political Science, MA Sociology, MBA in Operations Management, MPhil, PhD in Social Sciences with more than 30 years of experience, who has authored around 50 articles and published nine books so far. Currently, more than nine PhD scholars have already got their PhD degrees under his able guidance and supervision. So, sir, we welcome you on behalf of the entire management and the fraternity of LPU from the bottom of our heart. Welcome you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Deepak, to continue with the event. Okay, 
Okay, uh, now I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Thiel for his best wishes. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. And Dr. Deepak, am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Quite audible, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Dr. Vibhuti Shigawat, sir, and everybody present in the webinar. Today is really a great day that we all have gathered here by Public Administration Department School of Humanities, LPU Fagwara. For this, I would like to congratulate the entire department, especially Dr. Manvendra Singh, sir, Associate Professor and Coordinator, for this great effort. Great, sir. I hope very valuable thoughts will be shared by our resource person, Professor Dr. Vibhuti Shikawat. So, on behalf of the management and department, I again welcome Dr. Vibhuti Shikawat. So my best wishes are always with you and with the entire department. May God bless you all. Over to you, Dr. Manvinder. Thank you, sir. So without uh, delaying this event further, I would now like to hand over the uh, uh, stage to our esteemed uh, resource person of the day, Professor Dr. Vibhuti Singh Shekhawat, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Manvinder. I am... I would like to give my thanks to the management of lovely professional university who have given me the opportunity to share my views. And I have been associated with this institute since last more than two years with political science department, public administration, sociology and everything. I have been evaluating the PhD thesis and uh, conducting the VIVA and everything. So. Lovely professional university, I feel myself very, very comfortable with the staff, management and everyone. And I'm thankful to all of you. And I'm extremely happy to be associated with all of you today. Now, today's topic on which we have to talk is on peace, justice and strong institutions. Now, this topic is also mentioned in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number 16. But I'm talking about peace, justice, and strong institutions in India. And they are my political views, which I am sharing. So first of all, when we talk of peace, So the word peace is not enough. We must have to, we have to understand what kind of peace. If I recollect two years back, when there was the first wave of Corona COVID and three weeks lockdown announced by the Prime Minister, what was seen? Entire roads, cities, there was a total silence. Not a single person was visible on the road. Total curfew throughout India. And that kind of peace is very scary. You get scared of that kind of a peace. While you are in your institution, like you are roaming around a lovely professional university or my institute, and when no one is visible, not a single person is visible, that peace scares a person, very scary. So we are not talking of the peace of graveyard. You go to the graveyard, there is, it is very peaceful. Not that kind of a peace. We have to talk about a different kind of a peace. Now, it is basic human nature that something which we possess, we do not realize its importance. Whatever is going on, okay, it's going on, normal thing. But when somebody from your family is admitted in the hospital, who is in ICU, and you are running around in the hospital, that is the time you realize that when everyone was there in the house, things were normal, that was the best time. Everything was okay. And if 
if we compare ourselves with Afghanistan and Ukraine, then we realize what peace is. Today, there is a peace in the country or not? If we compare India with Afghanistan, what is the situation? Chaos going on in Afghanistan, civil war going on. And that civil war started in the year 1972 in Afghanistan. From 72 to 2002. Can you imagine 50 years? The disturbance, political chaos continues. They don't have strong political institution there in Afghanistan. That is the country where you will not find even one kilometer of railway line. So question is, is there any peace there? A developed country when entangled into a war, like the situation in Ukraine, the way it is going on, the way things are going on, this war is going to affect us very badly or not? Just wait for tomorrow or day after tomorrow. There is going to be a massive rise in the price of petrol, diesel, kerosene, LPG gas. And it will have effect further. So war is between Ukraine and Russia. Peace is not there in these two countries, but it is affecting, it was going to affect the entire world or not. So peace, as on say that India, as on today, there is quite peaceful situation. But the peaceful situation is not sufficient till justice is provided to the citizens of the country. Justice is not provided by the judiciary alone. We are not talking of the justice that is provided by the lower court, high court, supreme court. But justice has to be provided by the government. When government has to provide welfare schemes to the people and then only just spirit justice would prevail even the concept of ram rajya given by mahatma gandhi what he meant by ram rajya was not a hindu rajya what he wanted was the mixing of like he was not saying mix hindu religion with politics he was talking of mixing spiritual religion in politics. And he said, politics without religion is a death trap. And religion cannot be ignored. And then only concept of Ram Rajya in which there would be a quick justice. And quick justice is possible when we have strong institutions. Now, government has formulated various schemes for the development of the country in spite of massive rise in inflation, price rise, shortage. On that, the worst was Corona COVID. But even after Corona COVID and all these situations, some steps had been taken by the government recently. Whatever government could do in its limited capacity, government is trying. Like you can see on the slide, PM Mudra Yojana, Atal Pension Yojana, Prime Minister Jeevan Jyoti Yojana, Sustainable Alternative Towards Affordable Transportation, One Nation, One Ration Card, Ayushman Sekar, Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Ujjwala Yojana. The number is very large. But government is doing something to bring the peace. Now, a very important thing is how you can save your time. As we say, time is money. The most important thing in today, it is the time which you have. We have been saying, dunya ki sabse kimti cheez kya hai? Same. The time that goes does not come back. And government is now going in for high-speed corridors in the India. So that your time is saved. And a very big amount is spent 
on quick transport and communication and six routes you can see from delhi delhi mumbai delhi kolkata delhi varanasi delhi bhopal delhi amritsar delhi ahmedabad nagpur mumbai patna kolkata chennai bangalore chennai and it is going to continue further as and when there is a peace there is a development more and more development is going to take place then in addition to that something very sad and unfortunate from the year 1991 1991 if you recollect that was the period where india was in a turmoil only thing was financial emergency was not imposed in the country that saw it was the worst time in our country when mr chandrashekhar singh was the prime minister of india now issue at that time was that in the year 1990 there was a turmoil and chaos in india as mandal commission agitation was going on in its full swing throughout the country while mandal commission agitation throughout the country at that time to fight the politics of mandal bjp came out with the politics of kamandal and advani started rath yatra from somnath to ayodhya his rath yatra was stopped and there were communal riots throughout the country here students agitation communal riots and international scenario iraq's attack over kuwait and the result was india was buying petrol from iraq and kuwait only now supply of petrol stopped in the country there was and we have to buy from other countries price rise has gone up there was a shortage of petrol throughout india tension between india and pakistan reached at its peak in the year january 1990 or december 89 and january 1990 the local police of kashmir was on a verge of revolt against government of india can you imagine the government servant government this police was on a verge of revolt that was the time kashmiri pandits were thrown out of the country very cleverly the term used was kashmiri pandits as it was felt that in case the term used is hindus are thrown out all over the country there is going to be a reaction kashmiri pandits as we said now they were thrown out of the country country was in a chaos and in that chaos elections were held chandrashekhar singh was a prime minister and the reserve bank of india announced that we have foreign exchange available which we can use it for another one month one month passed and now the reserve bank started paying from the gold which was lying in the reserve bank that was the amount used to give the payment for the buying of petrol and diesel petroleum products can you imagine the situation that there was no petrol uh, there was no foreign exchange foreign exchange had become zero in that bad situation midterm elections were announced and midterm elections rajiv gandhi promised that 50 lakh people would be given employment essential commodities would be prices of essential commodities would be brought down in between the election rajiv gandhi died he was killed by ltt militants narsimha rao became prime minister with the empty treasury opposition questioned him that yes sir are you committed to the promise of your late leader rajiv gandhi price rise will be brought down within one month after taking over are you going to give employment to 50 lakh people now it was a very delicate situation for the prime minister narsimha rao anyhow for the first time he brought an expert dr manmohan singh as who was a ugc chairman he was made the finance minister of india and he started the policy of lpg liberalization privatization globalization and things developed yes for all this contribution this today 
our economy is in a very good state. We, in a very good state, what I mean is that I remember the time 40 years back when in the society, living standard was very poor. Today, what you observe, even a servants of your house, they have a color TV. They have an expensive mobile. They have a second-hand motorcycle. But was this there 40 years back? 40 years back, when you are watching TV, movie in the house, people from the neighborhood, everyone will come and everybody is watching together. Now every house, more than one or two TV is there or not? Every house, air condition is there or not? So it is a fact that living standard had gone up and for which we will certainly appreciate Finance Minister Manmohan Singh but what he did. But at the same time, when a man does good thing, mistakes are also done and they may be compulsions. Finance Minister Manmohan Singh totally neglected the expenditure on defense that was not curtailed down by anything. And while he was prime minister for 10 years during that time, also expenditure on defense was curtailed. Even after facing the Kargil situation, even the BJP government did nothing, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, prime minister, did nothing to buy arms, ammunition for the country. So question is, we are not to blame Congress, but we have to blame the at that time the BJP government also. In between, there was a another set of governments when there was an HD Devagoda, IK Gujarat. So that means everyone excluded, never bothered about uh, this development uh, of uh, in the field of defense. Whereas our neighbors like China, they had reached up to our borders. They have developed highways. They have made airports for the Air Force. They have made quicker this railway line connection, roads. Everything is made by China in our neighboring territory, like borders from Arunachal Pradesh to Himachal to Ladakh and everywhere, in Tibet, in Nepal, and we never bothered. And finally, when things were on a verge of explosion, that is the time this present government finding no way out available, things are vulnerable, money is sanctioned, and we have started buying modern weapons and aircrafts and modernization of our defense, which was neglected. Time and again, our army generals, chief of the army, in the presence of media, they came out that we are having a shortage. I have made few slides on that also, if it is possible. I would like to show you those slides that now we are making efforts to do development on the border side. Like now at Arunachal Pradesh, Ladakh, UP, whatever places which are having a border with China, there we have made efforts. We have purchased modern aircrafts from France, modern this defense equipment system from Russia. And of course, yes, now the slides are a bit visible. I would like you, if you can put to the next slide. Uh -huh. Next slide, please. Yes, recent developments in India. These are the tunnels and these are the aircrafts and this is on the bottom order where development has taken place. Now the next slide, please. This is an air defense system, Rafael Jet, and they have all been purchased now. Now, when we are well equipped, then the, our neighbors would also think twice, thrice, ten times before going in for any kind of dangerous adventure. Because there is a balance of terror. There is a balance of terror that has been maintained. Now, it is very clear that 
India will not attack China or Pakistan, even they would also think twice before attacking because there is a balance of terror that is very much there that you cannot achieve. We are not in the 17th or 18th century that you attack somebody's territory and take over. Today, times are different. Today, this cannot be done that you attack. This adventure was tried by Saddam Hussein. He attacked Kuwait and merged it in Iraq. And what was the final result? Not only Kuwait was liberated, Saddam Hussein was executed. And till today, for the adventures of Saddam Hussein, the people of that country, Iraq, are paying a heavy price. The way civil war is going on. And therefore, nobody, no country would like their balkanization as on now. And this period is a period of peace when there is no attack by any neighboring country and internal peace and security, which government is able to maintain. And this can be done only by a strong institution, that is by the strong government, strong parliament. And when the strong parliament is not there, then what happens is other institutions, they become very strong, like the judiciary. Now, a very important point of strong institution of parliament and the judiciary of India, I would, I would express my views on that. During the time of Jawaharlal Nehru, there was a balance of power maintained. It was okay. During Indira Gandhi's time, the government was very strong. And it is Shrimati Indira Gandhi who had misused Article 356. First time in the history of India, misuse of Article 356 was done in Punjab only. Probably many of the youngsters do not know that in the year 1952, there was a state by the name Pepsu, P-E-P-S-U, Patiala East Punjab States Union. And the state of Pepsu had made history in India. Like 1952, first election, all over India, Congress party came to power. At center, Congress came to power. All over India, in every state, Congress party came to power with exception to one state, that is Pepsu. Patiala, East Punjab States Union. Pepsu was different, Punjab was different. In Pepsu, first non-Congress government came to power and Sardar Jan Singh Ranewale, he became the chief minister of Pepsu. But very unfortunate and sad, that Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, he could not tolerate opposition in a tiny state of Pepsu. And for the first time in the history of India, Article 356 was misused and the democratically elected government of Sardar Gyan Singh Ranewali was dismissed on a very flimsy ground that law and order is bad in Punjab. There is no peace in Punjab. On, for the sake of peace in Punjab, a democratically elected government was dismissed. That was Pepsu. Later on, the state was merged in Punjab. He opened the way to misuse and access was done by Indira Gandhi. Like Indira Gandhi's government, could not tolerate opposition in any state. And it was seen, Subodh Mukherjee's government dismissed in West Bengal in 72. Charan Singh's government in Uttar Pradesh it dismissed. And throughout India, wherever there was a non-Congress government, it was not allowed to continue its full term. Every time the government is dismissed, the dismissed chief minister, what will he do? 
that dismissed chief minister will approach the high court and will approach the supreme court and the most unfortunate period situation was that in an illegal manner a democratically elected government is dismissed it is challenged in the high court and supreme court and judiciary has taken the responsibility that you dismiss the government and we will justify through our judgments that it is the discretionary power of the president president's power cannot be questioned charan singh government was dismissed subodh mukherjee was dismissed nt ramarao government was dismissed farooq abdullah government was dismissed in punjab during rajiv gandhi's time uh, indira gandhi's time darbara singh government was dismissed and after that when surjeet singh barnala was the chief minister in 20 months time his government was also dismissed and it has become a trend to dismiss the state government and the role of judiciary what it should have done it did not discharge and that encouraged the parliament the ruling party to dismiss any government on the way ground of law and order even when congress was not in power chandrashekhar singh he dismissed the government of m karunanidhi in tamil nadu the then governor of tamil nadu surjeet singh barnala he had not sent recommendation in writing normal procedure is that governor of the state has to send a written report to the president that law and order situation is bad but in case of tamil nadu the then governor surjeet singh barnala has not sent any recommendation to the president venkat raman but it was cabinet which has sent and ground was again law and order is bad and the government is dismissed suresh mehta in gujarat had proved the motion of confidence even when motion of confidence is proved government is dismissed that means state government has got no security if it is ruled by non congress government like for maximum time congress party was in power like at center if congress party is in power non congress government rarest of rare it can last it can last only if it is having 3/4 of majority and it was a miracle that communist party government lasted in west bengal janata party government when ramkrishna hegde was the chief minister lasted in karnataka but nt ramarao government was dismissed in tamil nadu and farooq abdullah government was dismissed in punjab government was dismissed and a wrong tradition was started by janata party in the year 1977 like in 1977 all over india congress party was defeated and for the first time in the history of india at the center non congress government came to power morarji desai became the prime minister but what was done by them they took the position that in eight or nine states nine states of india janata party came to power and thereby assumption was made that the state government which is in power has lost the support of the public and therefore it will not complete the full term and in between all the governments were dismissed and elections were held now when this was done by janata party the same formula was used by shrimati indira gandhi in the year 1980 when she came to power she said in all those eight to nine states where non congress government is there they have voted for congress party and therefore the non congress government has got no moral right to be in power and those governments were dismissed and after that there was a trend in the country and that trend was that whenever there is a lok sabha election and if the ruling party 
which may be any in the state level and some other party wins at the center the state government would be dismissed like supposing akali dal is in power in punjab and in the lok sabha election congress party has won then they'll take the position well akali dal has got no moral right to continue because public has voted for congress party for the center now the question is when public is voting they know who is required in the state and who is required in the center you can take the example of rajasthan in last two elections state assembly election and the lok sabha election the gap is less than one year it is 6 to 8 months so here in rajasthan in the last election in 2018 congress party was brought to power and just after 6 to 8 months there was election for lok sabha all the 25 seats had gone to bjp so now public knows who they require at the center and who they require in the state now the question is if supposing i am talking of a hypothetical thing that in the next lok sabha election supposing congress party come uh, supposing bjp and akali dal comes to power in power uh, reaches lok sabha then are you going to dismiss the aam aadmi party that your members have not reached parliament although it is not possible now because of the different situation so that was a trend in the country like there is a constitutional provision that in case union government gives directive to the state government and the state government fail to follow the directive state government could be dismissed and on these two points in the year 1991 because of law and order article 356 was used especially after the demolition of disputed structure in ayodhya which was a babri mosque that was demolished up government chief minister was kalyan singh his government was dismissed and after that the three more state governments ruled by bjp rajasthan madhya pradesh and himachal pradesh they were also dismissed now what was the trend till now that union government can dismiss any state government and judiciary will come out in the justification that yes you have done a right thing you ought to do any you dismiss any government justification through court judgment is our responsibility that was going on in the country for more than 45 to 50 years but the situation took about turn for the first time in the year 1992 it was 93 in fact i'm sorry 93 92 the government of rajasthan madhya pradesh and himachal pradesh they were dismissed on a flimsy ground that law and order is bad and whatever arguments were given the government was dismissed under article 356 now this time again the dismissed chief ministers they went to the high court sundarlal patwa the dismissed chief minister of madhya pradesh he went to the madhya pradesh high court and the full bench of madhya pradesh high court indore bench of madhya pradesh high court full bench gave a historic judgment that dismissal of bjp government in madhya pradesh was illegal and unconstitutional and the arguments given by the government was that yes there were communal rights but the chief minister had immediately taken control of the situation army was called rights were controlled union government gave a directive put a ban upon rss now for a bjp chief minister it was a very difficult situation because we know very well that rss and bjp they are two sides of the same coin all over india we know shirovani gurudwara prabandhak committee and akali dal they are two sides of the same coin or not although they try to claim we are different but everyone knows 
Akali Dal and Shirobani Gurdwara Prabandha Committee, they are two sides of the same coin. And similarly, RSS and BJP, they are two sides of the same coin. And union government gives a written directive to the BJP chief ministers, put a ban upon RSS. Now the CM himself is a member of RSS. His cabinet ministers are from RSS. Maximum MLAs of the ruling party are from RSS. And they are given the directive, you put a ban upon RSS. Now what will the CM do? The three chief ministers, it, they were in a very embarrassing situation. They approached Advani and Vajpayee. They said, what do we do now? The instructions given by Advani and Vajpayee was that we have already lost one government in Uttar Pradesh, Kalyan Singh government. Now, under all circumstances, these three governments have to be, we have to survive in these three governments. And till we get, challenge this in the High Court and Supreme Court, as or now, you better follow the directives of the government of India. Or else, as per the constitution, they can dismiss your government. And then what happened? The three BJP chief ministers, they called the chief secretary and the DG police and they were told, this is the directive of the union government and compliance may be done. And to the surprise of everyone, in the BJP ruled states, RSS volunteers were arrested. Their headquarters, there was a seize on their headquarters. Their bank accounts were sealed. Now, to put a ban upon RSS, what else do you require a government to do? They can arrest their volunteers, stop their activity, seize their property, and seal their bank accounts. And this was report was sent to the cabinet, but the cabinet came out with the opinion that yes, action has been taken against RSS, but the action has not been taken with honesty. And there has been law and order situation, and therefore the government is dismissed. So the Madhya Pradesh High Court gave the, reported this, that union state government had followed the directive of the union government, and they have controlled the law and order situation. Then on what basis the governments were dismissed? And the union and the Madhya Pradesh High Court gave directive that the dismissed government be restored back within one month. Just one month time was given. This came as a great shock to Narsimha Rao. Now we are all aware Narsimha Rao government was a very weak government. It was a minority government which was not having its uh, full support in the parliament. And with great difficulty it has passed for five years. And this minority government of Narsimha Rao sustained by managing defections in every party. Like charges were put upon Narsimha Rao for bribing the MPs of Jharkhand Mukti Morcha that they vote in favor of government at the time of vote of confidence. Then Narsimha Rao managed defection in various parties. Like first one which became the victim of Narsimha Rao's defection was Telugu Desham party. He used the Telugu card. I am a Telugu Vidda, son of the soil. And Telugu Desham party, P. Upendra with his MLAs, they left Telugu Desham and joined the Congress. And after that, there was a defection in Shiv Sena. Chagan Bhujbal and others, they had differences with Bala Sab Thakre. They joined the Congress. And after that, it was in the Janta Dal, Ram Lakhan Sev Yadav with his MPs joined the Congress and later on Ajit Singh also joined the Congress. But even then, government was not having full majority. But at that time, elections were scheduled in Punjab. And in those elections of Punjab, there was a boycott by Akali Dal. When there was a boycott by Akali Dal, that advantage was taken by the Congress party. And in the Lok Sabha elections, 98% seats were taken by the Congress party. And thereby, it was able to have a laser thin majority. But it was all clear that this government is very weak. And that is the time judiciary made itself very popular. In the next slide, I have mentioned about the judiciary. That how judiciary has 
become very popular it was from the 1998 time that there was a rise of judicial activism it was a period of judicial activism because weak governments were coming a minority governments coalitions were coming continuously and those coalitions lasting for 11 months 2 years and every 2 years there is a election like it was not clear that for 5 years government was not there after 1984 we got a majority government in 2014 and in the year 1991 in one year india has seen three prime ministers and in two years we had seen four prime ministers same was the situation in 97 98 the politics of the country was to such a level that every year there was a change of prime minister in 96 first it was atal bihari vajpayee in the same year it was hd devagoda in the next year i k gujral and in the next year atal bihari vajpayee and again there were elections so what had happened judiciary had become very strong and powerful so on the issue of this dismissal of madhya pradesh government a very tricky judgment was given by the supreme court it was tagged with sr bombay government which was dismissed in karnataka and with that they were tagged and supreme court had given a very tricky judgment whereby entire power has gone to the supreme court now supreme court had fixed the guidelines that only under these guidelines only you can dismiss the state government and one important guideline was that governor has to send report in writing without governor's report you cannot dismiss like it was done in tamil nadu ignoring the governor surjit singh barnala the government was dismissed but now they said no governor has to give it in writing and when you dismiss a chief minister you cannot dissolve the state assembly you can impose president's rule and assembly has to be kept under suspension and within one month you have to get this dismissal approved by lok sabha and rajya sabha you cannot misuse article 356 the way you like and after that misuse had stopped and i can just remind you that atal bihari vajpayee government tried to misuse this article 356 by dismissing rabadi devi government in bihar when dismissal was recommended there was recommendations were sent back by the president for reconsideration normally in india the president had never asked for reconsideration like kalyan singh had proved his majority when there was a coalition in up that six months mayawati would be chief minister and six months kalyan singh initially six months mayawati was cm and when the term of kalyan singh came mayawati had withdrawn the support within one month kalyan singh had proved the majority but the cabinet gave it in writing dismiss the government of kalyan singh but this time the president questioned he said kindly justify on what basis governor romesh bhandari has questioned recommended this dismiss the government of kalyan singh when live telecast has been seen all over the country that kalyan singh has proved the majority vote of confidence he has got on what basis you have recommended mr ik gujral had no answer for that cabinet could not reply to the objections put by the president same thing the president asked when rabadi devi government he said no i would like to send it back for reconsideration but even after reconsideration the same recommendation was sent and rabadi devi was dismissed but unfortunately lok sabha approved of that dismissal of rabadi devi government lok sabha approved rajya sabha things became very clear 
that it is not possible. And it was a big loss of face for Atal Bihari Vajpayee that within a month, the dismissed government was restored back. K.R. Narayanan, the president, had put a check upon both Gujran and Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Do not misuse these articles. And after that, what we are watching is that throughout India, Article 356 has not been used since last almost 20 years. More than 20 years, Article 356 is not used. And other ways of dismissal are not being used. So this is all because of the guidelines of the Supreme Court. And thereby, if the government at the state is strong, it is not the strong government. Strong institution is required at the center. We require strong institution in the state also. Today, a strong a government with a big commitment has come in Punjab, Aam Admi Party, and they are known for their honesty. Yes, it is a clear fact that these people are honest. That is what people believe. And they said, we can cut down unnecessary expenditure of the government on foreign visit, on helicopter purchase and all these things, and we'll utilize for the benefit of the people. Now, question is, they have done a lot in Delhi. Now, let us see what they can do in Punjab. But question is, if that government is not allowed to function and is dismissed in between, well, it would be a very sad state of affair or not. But it will not be dismissed because of the guidelines of the Supreme Court. And thereby, now the spirit of justice is being prevailed. It is not that we require strong government at the center. So we require strong institution at the center, but the strong institutions are required at the state level also. And thereby, if any state government wants to do something for the benefit of people, that government has to be allowed. Now, union government can't take the position that for prevailing peace, law and order issue, they dismiss any government. So now, a strong institutions, strong government would be there at the state level. They would be there at the central level. And of course, balance of power has to be maintained. Balance of power, mutual checks and balances are very required. The main success of democracy in America is that there is a complete separation of powers and there are checks and balances. No authority can behave like a dictator in an autocratic manner. There is a separation of power, total decentralization. And we have a decentralization up to the grassroots level. Panchayati Raj ministries are the Panchayati Raj government is there or not? Panchayati Raj system, what we are saying. So it is basically an issue of decentralization. When Panchayati Raj system, when it was introduced in the parliament by Rajiv Gandhi, there was a lot of criticism. And some satire were also very good. Some satires were that why only bureaucrats have the monopoly over the corruption of India, that only the bureaucracy has the monopoly and the ministry and bureaucracy and they are becoming rich. Why not we extend the corruption up to the grassroots level, to the Panchayati Raj, so that these people at the village level, they also become rich, well off, their living standard goes up through corruption. Well, this is the way to criticize. Some every good thing you do, some criticism, some drawbacks are always there. And what I'm saying today is the spirit of justice prevails. Now, the question is if the peace is not there, like Corona, COVID, entire work is at a standstill, judiciary is not working. What was the portion in the judiciary? Essential cases you come, otherwise, nobody will come. Give the dates. Just give the dates. Long dates may be given. Raisan High Court. Number of pending cases in Raisan High Court prior to COVID in the year 2018-19 were 3 lakh cases pending in Rajasthan High Court. Today in Raisan High Court, Jaipur, uh, Jodhpur combined together, more than 5 lakh cases, lakh cases are pending. Allahabad High Court prior to Corona COVID in 2019 
number of pending cases were only 9 to 10 lakhs. Today, more than 12, 13 lakh cases are pending in Allahabad High Court. And I think the same thing must be there in Punjab and Haryana High Court in Chandigarh, in the lower judiciary, all over the country. Now, the question is, there is a tension between the executive and the judiciary that is going on. Like the, what was done by Narsimha Rav's time, the judicial activism, that system, Justice J.C. Verma, the name which you can see, he came out with a judgment that there is going to be a collegium system. There would be a collegium of five judges in the Supreme Court and they would recommend the name of judges, honorable judges, in High Court according to the seniority that who should be elevated as Chief Justice of High Court and who should be elevated to the Supreme Court. And same collegium system was put up in the High Court also to recommend the name of advocates and the district judges for the appointment of judges. Now, the simple issue is the government of India came out, the BJP government in 2014 came out that this is not the system which was there in the Constituent Assembly of India. This you had introduced in the year 98-91 only. It was in early 90s you had introduced this system of collegium, which was not so early. Yet. And role of government has been made zero. All over the world, government does play a role. And therefore, they came out with National Judicial Appointment Commission. That how judges of the High Court and Supreme Court shall be appointed. Like there were certain corruption cases and immoral activities of some judges were visible. And they could not be removed. If I want to recap, you remember you people that in Punjab and Haryana High Court, when terrorism was at its peak, militancy was there, there was Justice Rama Swami. He was the Chief Justice of Punjab and Haryana High Court in Chandigarh. And corruption cases, inquiry was done by the High Court and Supreme Court, and they gave the report that, yes, Justice Rama Swami is guilty. And, but by the time report came, Justice Rama Swami from Chandigarh was elevated to the Supreme Court as a Supreme Court judge. And now the report came that he is guilty. So now question is, the Chief Justice expressed the opinion that I cannot seek even explanation from a High Court judge whether he is working properly or not. How much cases, how much quality disposal a High Court judge is doing? The Chief Justice of India does not have a right to ask. Forget about the Chief Justice of that particular High Court. Now, question is, when I cannot seek explanation, how about removal? Removal has to be via impeachment. Anyhow, on the pressure of BJP, impeachment motion was brought in the parliament against Punjab and Haryana Chief Justice V. Ramaswamy. But a very big politics was played by uh, by. Subramanyam Swami, whose Subramanyam Swami's name you have all heard. It was the same Subramanyam Swami that before Operation Blue Star, he had been to Darbar Sahib at Golden Temple Amritsar, been to Darbar Sahib and stayed there for a few days and had a meeting with the head priest at Akal Takht and Harmandar Sahib both. He had been at that time also. It was in 82-83. Now, Subramanyam Swami played a very big politics that, yes, Justice Veer Rama Swami is guilty. Corruption charges are proved. But even then, he should not be removed. Why? Because he's a South Indian. So being a South Indian is such a great thing that even if you are guilty of corruption, you should not be removed. If you are a North Indian, you are liable to be punished. And what had happened? Narsimha Rao's government ruling party Congress had maximum MPs from South India. So there was a north-south divide and two-thirds of majority could not be achieved and the impeachment motion failed miserably. And the corrupt judge could not be removed from the office. And after that, there were two, three more cases where corrupt judges could not be removed. There was 
corrupt cases of some corruption of high court judges from punjab also in chandigarh but what the chief justice took the position was that i am taking work from them that means they'll continue with the salary privileges all of a high court judge they will not decide the case in the high court and from recommendation was done that from punjab haryana high court these judges may be transferred to some other high court now the question is a corrupt judge of punjab is was transferred to guwahati now what was the result that in guwahati there was a strike by the bar council that why corrupt judges are being sent here we will not allow them to join if they are made to join we will boycott their court then those judges were transferred to chand to shrinagar with the aim to give them a punishment posting but bar council of shrinagar went on a strike so government of india came out that the way judges are being appointed and the way things are going on who is responsible it is basically the collegium system which is responsible for that and this judicial system has become a gymkhana club that existing judges whatever they like only they would be appointed and in rajasthan a one particular community a family tree was created that from one particular caste and community of jodhpur there are judges and 11 of the judges they are interlinked a one big family tree that was going on that we will not anyone else hence government came out with national judicial appointment commission but here judiciary asserted and they declared it as null and void constitutional amendment bjp geared up that we are coming out with another law but this time opposition said we will not support and therefore the law could not come and now there is a continuous tension between the executive and the judiciary where whatever names are recommended the judiciary recommends the law minister and the government of india has said that no we are not bound to follow your recommendations the law minister had made it very clear that i am not a postman that supreme court recommends the name through me and i just send them to president no i will go through the recommendations and i'll see whether the names are recommendation is proper or not and thereby all over india almost 40 to 50% vacancies are there in every high court throughout india throughout india in every high court and when number of judges are not full naturally backlog is going to increase and when backlog is increasing well justice is not there and it's a very old saying justice delayed is justice denied but our honorable judges say justice hurried justice buried now both the parties arguments are there judiciary says whatever names we recommend government of india is not willing to accept them it delays and we recommended 10 names and it government takes more than one year to approve by the time 10 names we recommend five are approved by the government and by the time five are appointed two three vacancies more come up and thereby throughout india so the judicial system is on a very bad state and it is on a verge of collapse where nobody wants to believe in the judicial system that you cannot wait for that law 40 years to 50 years but the question is can we blame the judiciary for that we cannot blame the judiciary for that so now the government says that we cannot accept the blind recommendation because government came out that certain recommendations which were there there were lot of illegalities and corruption cases that were visible against those people advocates and others and therefore we cannot accept them so now we require strong institutions but it has to be all strong institutions executive legislature and judiciary it has to be a combination of all if strong institutions are there 
proper decentralization is there, proper separation of powers are there, checks and balances are being maintained, then only the peace will prevail. For maintaining peace, a justice has to be given to the people of India. It is not only the justice of the government, but justice of the judiciary and everyone. Thank you so much. I have taken a lot of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivi Putta. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening us with the insightful session on uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions with special reference to India. Uh, now we are having a few questions from the participants who would like to ask a few questions. Um, Gideon, are you there? Gideon? Gideon. Yes, sir. Here I am. Uh, we are having this international student, uh, Vibhuti, sir, from Malawi. Yes, Gideon, you have any question? Uh, yes, sir. Just... Uh, Please turn uh, on your web camera, Gideon, first of all. Uh, can you allow me to just uh, use the mic proper, sir? Okay. Uh, yes, I can listen to you. Please come out with your question quickly. Okay, sir. Uh, the issue of uh, this balance of power, uh, you have verbally highlighted uh, the scenario in India with the, some cases. But uh, my take is that uh, it normally uh, appears to be a matter of coincidence uh, to have this balance, other than the, uh, the choice as the, some instruments that are there, such as the Constitution and other policies. Uh, may guide the processes. Now, uh, we are in the era of uh, social media, and we have got these institutions also, uh, members who also happens to be at the helm of these institutions, uh, make use of uh, technologies that are available to, 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 to today. And uh, as an it's example, nice. we have, we have uh, witnessed just, we have, how Listen to me, just a very small request. You please write right here what you are intending to ask. Can you please type and ask? So I am unable to understand what you are speaking, maybe because of your tone or something. So if you can just write here at the column, messages. If you don't okay, mind, sir. you can really type as one-line question, two-line question here, so that I can just read and I'll reply you. Okay, sir. Thank, thank you. And if someone else may come, till he writes, uh, someone else who has uh, the problem, they may please come. Any other student if, who is having any query, any question, any doubt? Any doubt? Hardeep, Hardeep, do you want to ask anything, Hardeep? Any doubt, any question, any other student? I would request the foreign student to please write down. I will request him to please write on the message box what is his question is, so that I may read. Tawseef, I think he is not writing. Tawseef Ahmad Mir, are you there, Tawseef? Tawseef Ahmad Mir, are you there, Tawseef? Yes, sir. Yeah, if you have any question, you can ask. I think the international student has written his question, how can these institutions regulate their conduct in this era of social media to maintain the balance of power, sir? So this well, is on that, What I have to come out is that the balance social media in this modern era is playing a very dangerous role. And it is putting a pressure upon the government. And this has been used more of for propaganda, spreading rumors and spreading hatred up to a level. You will find this communal provocative messages provocative videos, all are coming and they want to put excess pressure upon the government by forming a public opinion 
where government is compelled to act and uh, this is a very dangerous trend and this has to be checked freedom of speech and expression is not an absolute right in the public interest and morality reasonable restrictions are very very essential and this platform cannot be used to create a communal tension or between the two countries the relations cannot be broken up on those various issues it has to be put in check but as we are aware the technology had advanced so much that controlling social media is a very big headache and very difficulty and thereby it is for we common people that we have to be responsible in what kind of coverage the private tv channels are giving what messages we are giving on whatsapp what kind of things are coming on the facebook on that we have to be responsible and we have to understand the dangerous repercussions of that and government at a certain level has to put a check in case there is a misuse going on like some tv channels to increase their trp they may come out with different kind of reports like nowadays a atmosphere of terror is being created by the social media of this private tv channels in india the third world war is about to start this is various tv channels this is the caption they give the third world war is going to start so it's very nearby it can start any time and tension between america china in the sea and everything on that issue continuously third world war is going to begin it is going to start soon in last two years we are listening to that last two years on z tv aaj tak india tv republic various tv channels last two years i am listening that within two months prime minister imran khan is going to be thrown out these tv channels are reporting now question is how is it going to make difference to us if prime minister imran khan is thrown out of afghanistan uh, pakistan whoever is prime minister would be anti india because there is a competition in pakistan between the ruling party and opposition that who is more anti india but tv channels are continuously writing two months three months he would be out this and that report is being coming currently on ukraine russia conflict report is coming third world war so question is what private tv channels whatsapp facebook we should not believe them blindly that whatever is coming in there and whatsapp university is the most dangerous form of university which is giving the information and facebook authorities has to check that communal provocative things are not put on the facebook or government of india has to be made very clear that facebook twitter has been banned in china it would be banned in india also if this way happens whatsapp could also be banned and the authorities has to be brought to the knees and has to be made answerable to the government of india like up till now supreme court and high court their orders no value upon twitter facebook and whatsapp because there is nobody to listen nobody is there to answer in the court nobody is there to answer to the government and there why some mechanism government is trying and it has been up to a level successful also and that is the only way to maintain the balance of power and misuse of this social media right yes anyone else thank you, thank you sir thank you sir uh, uh, i think uh, dr gurjeet kaur is raising her hand dr gurjeet are you there sir yes sir i'm here uh, yeah. please increase your volume uh, 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 am i audible am i audible now uh, you are audible but not yes, visible okay um thank you so much sir for such an enlightening discussion uh and it was like uh, a bunch of books in, in such concise time and you feel enriched for being a part of this 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, respectable HOD sir, for letting me be part of this. Uh, sir, uh, my question to you is... Uh, Dr. Gurjit, can you turn on your web camera, please, if possible? Uh, yes, sir, I'm trying, uh, even though the network is a bit... Okay. Uh, maybe. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Now you come on. What was your question? Yeah, in advance, yeah. it might not be a very concise question. Uh, Please, loudly. Uh, okay, am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Now you are audible. I'll try okay. to understand. Now. So, sir, uh, you highlighted that uh, there is an, uh, I mean, institutional balance uh, is disturbed because of there were some precedences which were set and then uh, Indian political process has followed those precedences due to vested interests and all the clashes which we see. Uh, sir, my question is that uh, as per your uh, opinion, like is it a question of political ethics or is there a real constitutional ambiguity in the balance of uh, power among different institutions or is it both? Well, it is both. Certain things in the constitution are not clear, which are ambiguous, where different interpretation and meaning can be given. And this is observation of the Supreme Court of India also. Like when there was a conflict between the government of India and the chief election commissioner, TN Session. And when the matter went to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court said that if we decide in favor of government, government will misuse the power. If we decide in favor of election commission, they will misuse the power. So what things are not clear, they may remain ambiguous so that the balance is being maintained for future. And there are certain changes which are irreversible that come in the society. There are various, there are a lot of changes that initially they take time. They are revolutionary changes. But once they come, then we can't revert back. The social media. Now we can't revert back. Private TV channels, we can't revert back that the old system was better. So the changes that sometimes come in the society, we cannot reverse them. It is not possible. The change in the open economy. It was a closed door economy until 1991, which Indira Gandhi and Nehru were following. That was brought an end and new system came up. Now, can we go back to the same old period? So the it may be ethical, non-ethical, but sometimes the changes that come up, then according to those changes only, we have to do minor changes and adjustments. But we can't revert back. That is very difficult. Now, the change was brought in 98, 99. And now in the year 2022, can we go and change altogether? It is not, uh, it is very difficult. But gradually, people accept and things change. Like 50 years, 60 years back, things were very bad. A, a girl goes in for a love marriage. Honor killing would be done by the parents. It was a very dangerous trend or not? It was something very unfortunate that parents cannot tolerate their son and daughter living happily in their love marriage. For them, the family prestige was more important and honor killing was very common. But now, more than 90% honor killing has come to an end or not? So now question is, can we go back to the old era? Because changes are essential part of the society and those who do not change with the change of time, progress and development will stop. The mode of amendment mentioned in the constitution is that if any provision which is not doing very well, where change is possible for the benefit of the people and society, changes should be done. Constitution is not like Gita, Quran, Bible or Guru Granth Sahib that what is written once will remain forever. You cannot bring change in these books, but in the constitution, changes are must. And therefore, whatever are the changes, circumstances changed. And the changes are for good, if we see in a longer interest. But every change has some demerit also. But we cannot quote the demerit all the time and ignore the benefits. What we got. I hope I'm clear, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Gurdjieff, are you satisfied? 
डॉक्टर गुरजीत यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल एक्चुअली योर वॉइस इज ब्रेकिंग टू मच यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल इनफॉर्मेटिव लेक्चर based upon your rich academic experience now i request dr rajvinder kaur to propose a formal vote of thanks over to you dr rajvinder kaur madam please uh, unmute yourself ma'am please unmute yourself yeah actually sir there is one more session that is going on it's okay and uh, thank you deepak sir the sharing of slide can be also be put to an end last slide you put thank you and then put it's okay um well, dr deepak you can uh, stop presenting dr deepak you can stop presenting the ppt yeah yeah i think now it's much better yes good afternoon everyone and uh, i dr rajvinder on the behalf of the department of government and public administration I express my uh, heartfelt gratitude to the esteemed guest lecturer, uh, guest speaker of the day, that is Professor Vibhuti Singh Shekhawat, a renowned personality, and a really, uh, sir, it was a very good experience to listen from you today, and uh, it was a very, we can say, thought-provoking session. And thanks for sharing knowledge. and that was all based on your uh, experience and i have seen that how you have uh, that means it was just like a journey back to 1952 and uh, till the date 2021 really it was a very good one experience and uh, we learned a lot and i think students also have enjoyed this and they have learned a lot and sincere thanks to professor um, Dr. Pavitra Prakash Singh, head and the dean uh, of the School of Humanities, for inspiring and encouraging us to take such an endeavor. And thank you, sir, for being with us always. And uh, heartful thanks to Professor Dr. Kiran Dev Singh for his constant support and guidance, sir. And uh, apart from this, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Malvendra Singh, uh, Associate Professor, Department of. government and public administration here yeah, for organizing this event and uh, at the same time i will be very thankful to uh, the whole faculty of the department of government and public administration here yeah, for their contribution to make this webinar a successful one and uh, finally i would like to thank all the students and other faculty uh, present here and for making their time to be with us today and helping us uh, make this webinar a successful one thanks thanks to all and thank you one and all again thank you dr rajinder so once again dr vibhuti sir thank you so much for sparing your valuable time try again from the entire department from our dean sir so once again we thank you so much thank you dr manvinder and the entire team for organizing such a thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you so much vibhuti sir thank you so much kiran deep sir thank you sir